morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is John Matthews. I'm the executive director for AGWA, the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. I'm extremely honored uh, to be asked to moderate this session at Water Week at Home. I am also indeed sorry that we're all not together in person in Stockholm, but I hope you and your families are safe and healthy. This session is called Accelerating Water and Climate Action at COP26. We'll have uh, interventions from the public sector and donor community, from civil society, and from the private sector and investors. Our question for this session is how we effectively rise to the moment of this time, reconciling the scale of the challenges we face from climate change with the scale of the solutions that we propose. Great threats should be met with great courage. You, our audience, are critical here. We're seeking feedback, confirmation, and collaboration. DFID has especially asked me to ask you to listen for opportunities for partnership to reach out to us here and after the event about how we may all work together. We hope you'll submit questions as we, as we proceed by using the chat function in Zoom. We're eager for your voices in real time here. The session is as much as anything else an invitation. We'll post announcements as well as the session proceeds about initiatives, relevant hashtags and Twitter accounts and links to relevant publications and diagrams. We also hope you will help connect us to others outside of this live session by tweeting with the hashtag water at COP26. In addition, after the three speakers, we've set aside about 20 minutes for Q&A and I'll be fielding your questions for the three speakers. I would now like to introduce our first speaker. Lord Goldsmith is the UK Minister of State for the Environment in the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs and in the Department for International Development and the Foreign Office. Lord Goldsmith. Thank you very much indeed, and thanks for those um, opening remarks. Um, it, is, uh, it is an honor to be joining you and speaking to you today. I hope everyone's safe, I hope everyone's well. Um, the current crisis has already had a, um, a huge impact on the world on so many levels. I think in addition to all the effects that we've all seen, I think it has also exposed uh, many of our vulnerabilities as a species, and I hope it is also a wake-up call to the many consequences of our abusive relationship with the natural world. The pandemic has starkly highlighted the interdependence of climate change and health, in this case through hand washing, one of the easiest, most cost-effective ways to stop transmission and end preventable deaths, but impossible uh, without water security. Um, but terrible though, this experience is for so many families around the world um, and will continue sadly to be, the brutal truth is that it will be dwarfed by the effects of climate change and environmental degradation, unless we act very quickly and unless we act very decisively. However, if there is a silver lining to this tragedy, it's that politicians everywhere are having to deliver comprehensive, in some cases, unprecedentedly large economic recovery packages. So, uh, so far, governments around the world have committed well over $10 trillion to the COVID recovery. And how they choose to spend those funds is going to have ramifications for decades to come. And the choice is, is binary. We can stick with the status quo, knowing that high carbon, environmentally damaging industries will lock in decades of emissions, or we can choose to make environmental sustainability and resilience the lens through which we map out our respective recoveries. And you won't be surprised to hear that I favor the, la favor the latter course, as I'm sure everyone on this call does. And I'm delighted that our own prime minister <clears throat> has committed to, quote, build back better and build back greener. Um, as COP26 presidents, we're going to be making the case at every opportunity for a clean and green recovery. And we're asking other countries to deliver much greater ambition in their nationally determined contributions. And as well as building the political momentum, we also need to see action on the ground, which is why we've identified five campaigns, clean energy, transport, uh, low emissions vehicles, um, finance, adaptation and resilience, and finally nature. And it's the last of the five nature that is I believe most central and which is really at the heart of our approach and a thread that runs through each of our five strands. Put simply, we know that we cannot tackle climate change without also tackling environmental destruction and vice versa. Uh, the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis aren't two separate events, despite being treated as such too often. They're one um, in, in every meaningful sense and should be treated as one. 
we know that nature-based solutions could provide around a third of the cost-effective climate change mitigation we need over the next decade, while also helping reverse nature destruction, prevent poverty, enable communities to adapt and become more resilient, and much more besides. And in truth, it's probably higher than 30%. But despite the huge contribution that nature-based solutions can make, they attract a measly 3% of global climate funding and as little as 1% of water resources finance. And it, it just makes no sense at all. And it makes even less sense when we consider that there is a growing market for clean technology, uh, particularly the clean technology revolution that we are already seeing. It's not big enough, that market, but it's there, and undoubtedly, and it is growing very fast. There is no such market for nature. Consider the Amazon. The whole world depends on it, but its value barely registers. It is seen as uh, worth more dead than alive. And that's not surprising, given that the financial incentives that destroy forests outstrip incentives to protect them by around 40 to 1. And some put the figure much higher than that. And it's why last year at the UN General Assembly, the Prime Minister, our Prime Minister, committed to doubling our climate finance, our international climate finance, to 11.6 billion, and to ensuring that much of that uplift is invested in protecting and restoring nature. And as co host of the next Climate COP, we want other countries to do the same, and we're going to be asking them to do the same. Um, we need protection and restoration of nature to be a core priority globally. But even if we succeed in that ask, we also know that the cost of renewing and protecting nature at scale, um, at a scale that matches the problem, is going to be vastly more than public money can provide. So we're going to need to mobilize the private sector too. We will need to shift the perverse incentives that drive destruction. For example, the 50 biggest food producing countries spend around 700 billion a year in support for often harmful land use and agriculture, with only a tiny percentage going to sustainable land use. And that, if you add it up, is around four times all of the world's aid agencies combined. You only have to imagine the impact if that was redirected to reward sustainable practices that help protect the environment. We're also building alliances, north-south, uh, producer-consumer, rich-poor countries to remove deforestation from agricultural supply chains. Around 80% of deforestation is caused by agriculture, much of it to grow commodities that we all consume. And our discussion today, finally, is about water. And it is central. It cuts across all five of our COP26 objectives, our broader development efforts. And I don't need to tell this audience about the global water challenge. Four billion people uh, without enough water. Himalayan glaciers melting, water ecosystems collapsing. Um, already, it has to be said, donor countries invest a great deal in water. But for too long, I think our focus has been too narrow. So we chase clean um, uh, water delivery targets without I think thinking enough about where that water is going to come from, where the dirty water will go, what impact climate change will have on water security. And I think we broaden, uh, urgently need to broaden our focus. Here in the UK, we're determined to adopt a source to sea approach to water that reflects the natural cycle and better aligns with nature. We want to address the water crisis, but in a way that addresses health and biodiversity, pollution, food, energy production, a more nature-based focus. Our recent research tells us that the vast majority of investment goes still towards conventional infrastructure with very little reference to natural systems or the future. And yet around the world, we have an abundance of examples of projects that have worked with nature and delivered for people. Nature-based solutions, for example, have kept clean water flowing from the Catskill Mountains in New York in, uh, since the 1930s without the huge associated cost of purific purification. The Upper Tana Nairobi Water Farm estimates that a 10 million pound investment in watershed conservation delivers a return of around $21.5 million, including savings from water treatment increased power generation and increased agricultural yields. Uh, dams are controversial, particularly the large dams in terms of their impact on people and planet. But once they're built, their lifespan can be at least extended by better care of the environment upstream with better quality and quantity of water flowing into reservoirs. And in Vietnam, um, owners of small hydro plants pay communities 
that own the forests to keep them healthy and standing to avoid siltation and ruination of their equipment. And with UK support through the Asia Development Bank and green infrastructure solutions are being developed for cities to address flooding and disaster risk management. And then finally, closer to home here in the UK, water companies are already paying farmers to manage their lands to slow the flow of water and increase absorbability not least to reduce the need for capital investment in concrete defenses now, all these solutions and there are many 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 more uh, either use or copy natural processes and there are just so many examples around the world as countries make new investments in energy, transport, water and cities, we have an opportunity to align them with ecosystems and ecological processes. And the evidence suggests that nature-based solutions can not only be more sustainable than the alternatives, but cheaper, less prone to corruption, more likely to provide jobs and livelihoods in the long term. So we need rapidly, I think, to reposition ourselves to tap into these opportunities. And we should acknowledge that in spite of growing water insecurity around the world, there's very little accountability and transparency in relation to the water crisis locally, um, nationally or globally. And, and that also needs urgently addressing. Uh, one way is through smarter water indicators. Um, so with UK Aid, a consortium led by Northwestern University has developed a household water insecurity index that quickly and reliably says how ordinary people are reacting to water problems. And on the back of it, a new consortium of Northwestern University, UNESCO and Gallup is benchmarking water insecurity across Africa, uh, India, Bangladesh, Brazil and China, plus several other Latin American countries. And I know my fellow panelist, Sarin Malik, will talk more about how this will work when she speaks shortly. Um, we also need to acknowledge that overseas aid is never going to be enough to realize the Sustainable Development Goal 6. So I'm looking forward to hearing from our third panelist, Saja Bezlik, on what investors and businesses need so that they have the knowledge and confidence to ramp up their investments. In the UK, we are committed to escalating our efforts. We're going to be mainstreaming water across all our development programming um, and policy work in the new uh, merged FCDO. Um, we will develop new strands on biodiversity in rivers and lakes, as well as the marine pollution caused by plastic and sewage. Uh, we'll soon be launching our new half a billion pound Blue Planet Fund to help tackle that pollution um, and protect critically important marine, system, marine ecosystems uh, all around the world. And we're forming new partnerships with like-minded donor countries, as well as using our influence to persuade the MDBs to focus more on nature-based solutions. For example, we're working with the Dutch through the Global Commission on Adaptation uh, Water Action Track. Um, in our virtual hosts, Sweden, we have an important ally on climate and environmental issues, and we're delighted with Swedish support for the UK-led 30 by 30 initiative to protect at least 30% of the planet's ocean by 2030. We're also very aligned on freshwater, joining together to support water initiatives such as the Global Water Partnership and Sanitation and Water for All, uh, and we really look forward to growing those relationships. We have a checkered history when it comes to water in the UK. We learned very harsh lessons from cholera, cholera outbreaks in Victorian London, uh, the death of important major rivers like the Mersey and even the Thames. Uh, but we've also learned how to undo some of the damage and to address new threats like microplastics, effluent discharge and leakages. And one of the really big changes that we'll see in the UK will come from our decision to switch our entire agricultural subsidy system away from rewarding destruction towards an environmental land management system based on public money in return for public goods. For example, maximizing biodiversity, managing land in such a way as to improve water flow and retention, reducing flood risk and so on. Using UK aid, we're currently building three large climate change programs in Asia, Afra, Africa, and the Middle, uh, Middle East and North African regions. Each will have significant water components and a major focus on nature-based solutions. Finally, we know in the UK that even we get, if we get our own house in order, our water footprint nevertheless extends vastly beyond our shores. 
Um, the agricultural commodities we import alone come with huge levels of water consumption. 70% of fresh water use globally is accounted for by agriculture and the livestock sector is currently using about 20% of fresh water for feed production. We're told it takes 15 and a half thousand, just under 15 and a half thousand liters of water to produce one kilogram of beef and just under 6,000 liters to produce one kilogram of pork. And by contrast, it takes around 287 liters of water to grow one kilogram of potatoes and 16, um, um, 1608, 1,608 liters to produce one kilogram of bread from wheat, a massive difference. So we're determined to clean up our own water footprint and to work with others to deliver change internationally. And if we get it right, we can protect freshwater resources in consumer and producer countries around the world and help ensure a healthy, secure and prosperous future for the world's poorest. We are completely committed to working closely with all of you and I hope that what we learn today will facilitate a government to government dialogue at COP26 and in the run up to, to COP26 and I invite all of you to join this effort. We have all the tools that we need, we have most of the knowledge we need so in my view it is time now to get to work. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Lord Goldsmith, for that strong and positive message. Uh, we now turn to Ms. Serene Malik. Uh, she's joining us from Kenya. Uh, she is the Executive Secretary of ANU, the African Civil Society Network for Water and Sanitation. Uh, um, uh, Serene leads ANU, the umbrella organization of water and sanitation NGOs in Africa, uh, present in over 50 countries. She currently holds the position of Vice Chair on the SWA Steering Committee with over 15 years of experience in water governance and restructuring WASH NGOs. She focuses on working with NGOs to meaningfully engage in the water sector and in the anti-corruption sector, mo mobilizing voices around the call to action that good water governance is key to improved water sector performance. Serene has widely published and supports the development of water sector uh, governance tools for state and on-state actors. Serene. Thank you, thank you, John. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, Minister Goldsmith, and on behalf of ANU, our 47 country members, reaching over 700 CSOs and 422 million people living in poverty in Africa, for whom we seek water justice, I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Would like to respond to the Minister's comments and set out the priorities for accelerating action on water and climate emergencies, drawing on the evidence and the perspectives of the constituency in which a new represents. Who we represent? We represent those at the front line. As you mentioned, the 63% of population in Africa that according to the World Bank do not have access to basic water services and cannot protect themselves from their children from COVID or cholera, like you mentioned. We represent the millions forced to migrate every year because of intensifying climate impacts, droughts, floods. We represent African women and girls that spend every day 200 million hours collecting water and whose daughters and daughters' daughters will be locked into a life of ill health, violence, and poverty if we fail to address the water crisis. On their behalf, we welcome Minister Goldsmith's commitment to the UK's leadership at COP26 and beyond the campaigns outlined by the minister, what we need most is a laser beam focus, what we feel are on two major outcomes. First, we need a binding mechanism to limit global heating to 1.5 degrees. Already an additional half a billion Africans are facing acute water stress because of climate change. Second, we need the COP26 to unlock the 100 billion US dollars a year pledged in Copenhagen in 2000 to help developing nations adapt. We welcome the minister's commitment to nature-based solutions. We know you are deeply passionate about the issues of nature-based solutions. We agree. Conservation, agriculture, and wetland management play a central role in a sustainable water picture. But at the same time, we urge caution against the hazard of an exclusive focus on one or other type of technical fit. David's own evidence tells us that nature-based solutions don't have a great track record of benefiting the poor. In fact, because of, as you mentioned, the weaknesses in land tenure and governance more widely. So rushing to nature-based solutions could also fragment action on much bigger priority of good governance across and beyond the water sector. All solutions, green or concrete or colored, must be driven by accountable governance as you have rightly said so. 
by strong institutions which can select the most appropriate fixes, then finance and sustain them in ways which are inclusive. Nature-based solutions, yes, but ensuring that people are at the center. People-based solutions and governance-based solutions, which will be needed to make these solutions work and NBS work. The minister is also correct to highlight the impact of water footprints of wealthy countries on the water security of the global south. In fact, to add to the additional fact, uh, uh, this means that while every UK citizen directly uses one bathtub full of British water per, per day, indirectly they suck up nearly 30 bathtubs of other people's water. And this tells us that a fifth of this comes from Africa. Yes, we welcome the extra jobs, but these the problem of water is trampled on local people through pollution, degraded ecosystems, water grabs, and heightened vulnerability to climate shocks. What we ask for is, of course, certification against better stewardship within this sector. We also welcome the minister's comments on the role of business and investment community. And I look forward to hearing from Sasha about what more can be done. Uh, from our perspective, as much as we need green finance, which targets the good and diverts from the bad, we need clean finance, which avoids the ugly corrupt pr practices and offshoring of profits. But in all this, the primary, the most important, and what we feel the number one priority, and as you have met and mentioned again, is accountable governance. Inclusive governance, which has integrity, which is the answer, and will make the difficult trade-offs, enforce the laws, control the finance, and address the service delivery failures, as well as the political will. And this is where we come in. Civil society plays a fundamental role in driving good governance representing those without voice, bargaining for charge, and speaking truth to power. It is backed by the results of the global evidence that we're launching this morning by Water Witness International. The problem is that even pre-COVID, support for civil society, Africa, from multilateral and bilateral donor has been drying up. This compounded with the fact that the space is constantly and increasingly shrinking. And we're afraid that DFID hasn't invested strategically for almost a decade, and it's not alone. The cruel truth is that nearly 72 countries have introduced new laws to restrict the activities of CSOs and journalists. Last year, over 200 people were murdered actually for protecting the environment and protecting water resources. That is unacceptable. So we urge Minister Goldsmith to be even bolder in his ambition to demonstrate UK leadership for climate and water security by getting a proper deal on emissions and adaptation at COP26 using the UK's position as a key financial and trading hub to transform global business and investment so that they are clean as well as green and focus on the UK's diplomatic power and aid programs to drive accountable governance, protect the freedoms of civil society and to address the resourcing gap which holds back our ability to drive change. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Serene. Uh, we now turn to uh, Mr. Sasha Beslik. Mr. Beslik is an international uh, financial expert known for promoting financial sustainability across the world. He's been with Jay Safra Saracen since 2019, where is the, he is the head of sustainable finance development. He set a long record uh, around using finance to advance sustainability. Indeed, in 2013, he was awarded the Order of the Seraphim by His Royal Highness King Carl Gustav of Sweden for extraordinary efforts in the field of finance and sustainability. Mr. Beslik. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. Uh, I work for a, a sustainable asset management firm based in, in Switzerland, in Zurich, and uh, we've been doing this for uh, approximately 30 years. Uh, I myself have been in the field of sustainable finance and sustainable investments since beginning of 2000. I had a privilege and opportunity to visit uh, many places around the world over the last 20 years, uh, visiting companies and industries that are highly dependent on access to water, but also have a significant impact in the way how the products and services are impacting local communities, water resources itself, and uh, infrastructure, uh, which is uh, providing water for millions and billions of people around the world. Uh, one of the things that sort of my angle in this is, uh, is related to experiences I have um, in this sector, uh, water sector being particular, but also sustainable finance and in, in investments in general. 
and seeing the tremendous change in the way how the environmental aspects of investments have uh, gained importance over the last, uh, I would say, three to four years. But also the fact that the water being one of the elements of environmental and social and governance investments is still not as covered as it should be, given its importance. Uh, if we look at the numbers from investment point of view, and I think it's fair to sort of uh, take this from two angles. One is water being a human right uh, for billions around the world, and one is being an uh, investment opportunity of a century, uh, giving uh, the needs and the demand and supply that we will see going uh, forward in the future. We expect about 20 to 30% increase in, in water demand across 10 to 15 years from now. We also see the huge um, consequences related to climate change, particularly in regards to water access, but also water efficiency and use of water across different sectors around the world. And we also see a huge gap in the way how the information that is available to investment community is verified and available for us in order to make um, very sort of a focused and targeted investment decisions. In many cases, and this was mentioned earlier, due to corruption and also lack of transparency, the information and the data that we need to make investment decisions, particularly on water, is not uh, where it should be. And in many cases, it's not even addressed uh, since many of the companies and corporates around the world and different industries, starting for particularly from garment industry being one of them. I visited many places in, in Southeast Asia uh, with astonishing pollution uh, related to uh, production of the garments uh, for, uh, for a global market, uh, where uh, water is seen as, as commodity and not as asset and treated in a such way. Uh, we also see uh, we are investing in one of the one of our leading strategies that we manage is related to water, water efficiency, uh, technology development, and resource efficiency. Uh, investing in the companies that are uh, providing solutions for the needs that we have. Uh, over the last two years, we have seen a huge interest uh, from various client groups and and stakeholders into uh, investments in this kind of products. However, uh, if we uh, step aside of just particular water investments and these type of investment solutions, if we are looking at the mainstream investments across the world where companies that we invest in have significant impact through their products and services and also through their production on the water resources, we can clearly see there is a huge gap in what needs to be done and also what is done today. Uh, one of the things that I've been, and this is on maybe the forum to uh, to address this, uh, this uh, uh, been thinking about and, and uh, wishing to happen is some kind of water regional investment plans uh, and also uh, transparency in terms of the, the data that needs to be provided by corporates for us to understand what is the water footprint they have on a product product and service level, but also in the way how they um, transport, logistically transport some of the products across the world for us to consume. And this is the area where I think uh, if we are going to tackle one of the biggest challenges and also one of the biggest opportunities, investment opportunities of the century, uh, this is the area where we really need to focus and increase efforts both from the governance side, governance, uh, government side uh, transnational organizations, civil society, but also from the business. We need information. Uh, we want to have the information to make investment decisions and everybody understands, we understand that as much as, much as anybody else, that this is the core element for us uh, in order to be able to uh, provide transition to sustainable future we all need, we all expect. Uh, but I think we need to focus on, on water being asset, uh, being very valuable resource that needs to be internalized in a way how we manage investment products, not only specific water strategies, but also uh, strategies that are currently used to basically reshuffle capital around the world. So if we don't do that, we are going to step into the space where water will remain uh, as one of the shadow sort of uh, themes within the broader environmental theme and uh, be treated as that uh, without any significant support on the data level that we need to use in order to continue investing in a sustainable way. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sasha. I, I really appreciate your, your comments. Uh, we now turn to the question and answer se session. And um, 
I welcome all of you to uh, post your questions in, in the chat. Uh, uh, we will uh, then forward them on to uh, each of the panelists. I'd also like to uh, reference uh, one of the announcements that's uh, coming with this session, which is a theory of change that's been developed uh, uh, by a broad team uh, led by Nick Hepworth with Water Witness International. Um, and uh, there's a, a diagram uh, that's just been uh, posted uh, so you can, you can uh, take a look at, at that. Um, one of the big ideas behind the theory of change about how we advance uh, around uh, water and climate action um, as we move towards the COP as well as beyond is uh, how we think across these broad modalities of action, these sectors of action. Um, if I could summarize just uh, very briefly uh, some of the comments that we heard, uh, nature-based solutions uh, are uh, one of our new modalities, our, our new ways of, uh, of uh, engaging with economic development, uh, a, a strategy that has, has really been left out of the conversation uh, to date. Those were comments from uh, Lil Goldsmith. From uh, Serene Malik, uh, we heard a strong, uh, a passionate statement about the need for both clean and green uh, finance and governance. Uh, that if we go with nature-based solutions, that we need to make sure that they are people-centric. Uh, and then uh, a very thoughtful uh, a set of observations from uh, Sasha Veslik about the importance uh, of, of seeing uh, trends in investment, about uh, making sure that we see uh, water as an asset, not simply as a commodity, um, and uh, an asset that can be uh, devalued or revalued uh, over time. Uh, I'd like to maybe start off with a, a question uh, that came from uh, Charles Reeve. Uh, he's in South Africa. Uh, uh, he has asked, uh, given the comment from the minister that the majority of funding seems to go now towards conventional infrastructure solutions, how do we secure more financing for nature-based solutions? Um, uh, Lord Goldsmith, would you like to uh, start with that? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it, look, it's it's the figures are, are disputed. I, I had a figure that I was going to include in my speech, but it was it, there were question marks over its veracity, and I didn't want to mislead people. But we're looking at the tiny, tiny, in, you know, single number percentage points um, of, of money that's spent on nature-based solutions. The low end of single figures. Um, how do we change that? Well, governments have to change that for one thing. It's not all about governments, but governments can take a lead. Um, and so when, as I, I think I mentioned in the speech, the, the UK has committed to doubling our international climate finance, but we said that much of that uplift will go towards nature-based solutions. Um, we haven't publicly uh, put a figure to that or a percentage to that in terms of our total ICF funding, which will go towards nature-based solutions, but it'll be a very significant percentage. Um, and one of the things that we'll be doing since we're holding the megaphone uh, in the run-up to COP is to try and persuade other countries to do the same. That's the sort of government direct funding donor country angle. But as, as we've just heard from other panelists as well, it's not all about public money. We do need to change the way pri private finance flows. Um, and finding those opportunities for private sector investment in nature-based solutions or, or even the, the issues that we're talking about more broadly are very, very difficult. If they weren't difficult, we'd already have that market like we do with solar power, wind power and so on. We don't have those that mature market yet. There are lots of small examples of where the market has been deployed. The Vietnam example, I think, is one of the most obvious ones with hydropower uh, owners paying forest owners to look after the trees so they don't destroy their capital investment. Here in the UK, same thing with the water companies, but they're micro, tiny, tiny examples. Uh, as compared against the scale of the problem. So mobilizing private finance is a massive part of it. But if I can make one last point on that, we don't want to hog the, hog the, 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 the microphone now. Um, a lot of work has gone into carbon disclosure um, and Mark Carney is leading a stream of work for us here in the run up to COP as well, in terms of how we might push that agenda even further. There hasn't been so much work on nature disclosure, how to nature proof investments. And that is a stream of work which I'm hoping through co-hosting COP with Italy, we'll be able to take a, a significant step forward between now and COP. It's an area of work that absolutely has to happen. Somehow we need to mainstream uh, nature proofing, both in ODA investment, but also more importantly, I think in private sector finance. 
Excellent, thank you. Uh, I have a question each for uh, Serene and for Sasha. Um, and they're really variations on, on, on one question. Um, uh, for Serene, it's a question of how do we get the governance incentives right uh, for effective nature-based solutions and water security uh, across uh, all the sectors? Uh, and Sasha, uh, how, uh, how do we get the financial incentives right? Uh, um, maybe we can uh, together piece together a larger answer from the two of you. Serene first, please. Well, I think it really starts with policies that are in place, recognition of nature-based solutions, but also the stakeholders that are within the nature-based solution framework. Nature-based solutions also needs indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowledge also means communities. It also means the mobilization of these communities, the respect of these communities, and the participation of these communities when it comes to nature-based uh, uh, solutions or the work around water security. All too often, we see um, initiatives come in. First of all, there's policy vacuum somewhere, and second of all, the structures, governance structures are not in place to enable these communities to actively participate in uh, the, the, the in the nature-based solution cycle, in uh, um, uh, the policy making and decision making which comes with this. Um, so I'd say let's start with community mobilization. And again, I'll come in again on the role of civil society within uh, um, uh, this uh, um, uh, within uh, NBS, but also in terms of what are the policies. But there's also the issue of political will, which is really critical. So how do we build that critical mass? And this a lot has to do with the partnership and the collaboration that we, uh, the sector has been talking about a lot over the past couple of years. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, Sasha. Thanks, it's a very interesting question. You have to, uh, when we discuss that, you ha we have to bear in mind one fact that I don't think has come across. And that is the fact that if you account for all the capital today in the world, which is invested, uh, approximately maybe 10 to 15% is invested in a sustainable, environmentally friendly way. A fraction of that is a small, small fraction may be related to water and we will not even mention a uh, nature-based solutions. You see in our world, the nature-based solutions are externalities that are not priced. As long as they are not priced and valuable, in the way how we calculate uh, the investment returns or how we calculate projections for certain sectors, uh, these elements will probably not be included. And this is the sort of area where we need to sort of uh, uh, ask governments uh, and transnational organizations to help us to drive agenda, which is done in a CDP partly, uh, there is a water disclosure project as well, uh, is to drive the agenda to increase uh, the regulation uh, or at least increase the transparency and information level access that we can have uh, for corporates to report on, especially on scope three emissions and scope three impact they have through the supply chains and products so we can get access to the information. In many cases, you would be surprised uh, to see uh, how the corporates are reporting on the uh, scope three emissions, not only on carbon side, on CO2 emissions, but also especially on the water side. That information in many cases is not traceable, uh, not verified, and we have big difficulties to actually take that into account. Excellent. I, I'm really struck by all three of you uh, focusing in your comments uh, and then in your subsequent reflections on finance as a powerful tool for leverage about uh, focusing values, about making sure that we have effective uh, climate action, not just talking about more money, but actually the quality of how that money is spent uh, and, and reinforcing the larger goals in a more coherent way. I have a, a question here. Uh, maybe more of a, of a, a comment uh, directed uh, to Will Goldsmith from uh, my friend, Adrian Sim. Uh, he uh, uh, wants to know if you uh, believe that maybe one way of engaging around the water footprint and the private sector, uh, maybe through uh, uh, approaches such as water stewardship. Um, thank, thank you very much. Um, can I, can I, I want to, I, I hope you don't think I'm swerving the question, but Serene gave a very powerful uh, presentation and it was a real challenge, I think, to, to governments, to me, um, to ramp up ambition. And I, I just wanted to, to, to note that and, and acknowledge what she said, but she's right. Clearly, we need to ramp up our ambitions. We need to ramp up our support for the right solutions. So thank you very much indeed for that. The other point that I think I, I ought to acknowledge was the, the role 
which is a theme that ran through her words, uh, the role of civil society. Um, and, and she's right about that as well, clearly. We, we can't deliver the solution without working with the people who are gonna be most affected, the people at the grassroots, communities, people. And when I talk about nature-based solutions, I'm not just talking about planting mangroves or planting forests or protecting forests and protecting mangroves, much as that is hugely important. I'm also talking about initiatives to create structures that will ensure the healthy coexistence between people and nature going forward. So for example, helping communities or indigenous people assert their ownership, their rights over the land in which they live. For me, that is a nature based solution because the likelihood is that you're going to end up with land that's protected and not over exploited by often distant and multinational corporations or states that have little regard for local communities so uh, uh, when i talk about nature-based solutions i'm imagining something much much broader than simply planting or protecting forests and i just wanted to put that on the on the radar because i, I very much appreciated what serene uh, has said in terms of mobilizing finance one area where um I think it's difficult, but it's going to, I think inevitably a really big part of the solution is around carbon markets. And I think that it's not, you know, and that has a direct bearing on the nature-based solutions discussion we're having at the moment. We know that all the public, all the public money in the world is not going to be enough to solve the problem. We know we're going to need private finance. One mechanism is through development of trusted carbon markets. And my view is as long as you have quality control on the supply side, and quality control on the demand side. In other words, the companies that engage in offsets, for example, are legitimate companies with legitimate, responsible, tested plans for making sure their companies are reconciled with nature and compliant with Paris and so on. Then I think you have the capacity, the possibility of seeing really significant sums of money transferring into nature-based solutions. It's a sensitive area, it's politically difficult as an area, but we have to find a way of doing it and doing it properly and legitimately, um, I think, because otherwise we're never going to reach the level of finance that we need. Uh, Sasha, Serene, do you have a, a response? Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm guessing not. Uh, all right. Um, uh, one, there was a very interesting question about the role of um, uh, development banks in particular. As, as maybe one of the important delivery mechanisms. Uh, they were mentioned briefly in your uh, comments, Minister, but um, maybe this is also uh, one of the, uh, the ways that we can actually help uh, use uh, development, development banks as a way to uh, fuel partnerships, uh, to, to, to build um, that, that, that kind of connective tissue uh, between uh, financial vehicles and, uh, and communities that you were referring to, uh, Serene. Um, do you, do you have thoughts on, uh, on on that relationship? Is that a question for Serene? I think it is. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, John, I missed that. <laughs> if we could just, uh, if we could just, <laughs> I know it's supposed to wrap up, <laughs> but just very quickly, if you could just repeat the question. Sure. Do you see uh, uh, the development banks as 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 maybe? Uh, uh, a, a kind of institution that can help build the types of partnerships that you're looking for from uh, civil society as well uh, around uh, a financing clean and green uh, uh, solutions. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, mostly because you know civil society is at a uh, crossroad where it has to look in terms of how does it diversify its uh, resources. But again, you know, there's always the issue of capacity of how civil society actually engages with the uh, development bank and how well the development banks have integrated civil society and communities a bit in their uh, in their work. Uh, but this is definitely something that even within the continent, within a new uh, where we are now starting to forge ties with the, the development banks that we're finding on the continent. We're seeing it with SWA as well, where we're seeing more and more development banks coming into um, into the phrase. So this is something definitely that uh, should receive a lot more attention and should receive a lot more focus as well. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. I apologize that we're not going to be able to, uh, to have uh, more questions in the session. We need to, to wrap up, but we invite you to follow up uh, through, the, through the chat by email afterwards uh, and, uh, and, and really uh, continue the conversation uh, beyond the bounds of this session. 
I'd like to uh, thank all of the speakers, uh, Mr. Goldsmith, uh, Mr. Sasha Bres Beslik, and uh, Ms. Serene Malik, uh, the British Embassy in Stockholm uh, for its support, K4D for technical and communication support, the Trigger Group for Diffid's Water Team, led by Nick Hepworth at Water Witness International, uh, reviewers for the K4D papers, uh, the technical team guiding the call, and CUE for the venue, and lastly, our audience uh, and your active engagement and excellent questions. Um, uh, I'd like to, uh, to just make three very final points. Uh, uh, climate change and COVID-19 have really made us profoundly aware of the need for what we could think of as big resilience, the, the, uh, the, the deep connections between countries, between institutions and sectors, um, uh, and, and how uh, we think of resilience in, in the broadest sense. Uh, especially with shifting economic resources, we need to think smarter about how we support and intervene in developing economies to ensure that we can work across silos, seeking multiple benefits and aligning institutions and funders. Lastly, natural systems and nature-based solutions are critical for both social and economic resilience. They need to be people-centric too, though, and we need to integrate and enable NBS for that big resilience. Thank you all. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night.